Well, thank you, folks, for allowing me to pray with you and to pray over you. So what I want to do tonight is I want to go to a passage of Scripture that's probably one of the most beloved passages in all of the Bible to most people. Even people that really don't know the Word of God that well, most people around the world have at least heard of this passage of Scripture. They certainly have heard of the one who wrote it. And a lot of people, even if they wouldn't call themselves a born-again believer, they still know this and maybe have recited it or learned it or quote it or at least refer to it. And yes, I'm talking about the 23rd Psalm. I want to minister this to you tonight, maybe give you some insight that you've not thought of before. The 23rd Psalm. We're going to go to that scripture in a moment, but even before we do that, I want to take just a second. Now, I, I, I want to read something. To, it's just a funny little joke, if you will, uh, a story. It's about a guy and a shepherd out in the field. I thought you'd just get a kick out of it. Normally, I don't like to read stuff to you. And when I tell jokes from the pulpit, I don't read them. I tell them and I act them out. And you know, I get all dramatic. My, my home folks know that. Uh, but tonight, I, I came across this almost just, uh, hopefully it was providentially, but it seemed almost accidentally to me as I was calling up the, uh, the scripture from the, uh, from the website so that you could see the scripture with me on the screen tonight. And, and I saw this, my eye caught it as a, another web page, and I said, well, let me just see if there's anything to this. And it was just funny to me. I hope it'll be funny to you. So I'm going to read it, and uh, hopefully I can read it dramatic enough that you will you'll enjoy it as well. So I'm not going to put it up there so you have to sit there and read it with me, but just uh, kind of follow along with me. I think you might enjoy it. So let me, um, let me go here. Okay. All right. It's called, Do You Know the Shepherd? And it said, and it goes like this. So there was a shepherd who was tending his flock in a remote pasture out in the middle of the country when suddenly a dust cloud came boiling down the road. And out of that dust cloud emerged a shiny silver BMW. The driver, a young man, handsome, dashing, in an Armani suit, Ferragamo shoes, the latest polarized sunglasses, and a tightly knotted power tie. He poked his head out of the window and he asked the old shepherd, Hey, shepherd, if I can tell you how many sheep you have in your flock out there, will you give me one of them? The shepherd looked at the man and glanced at his peacefully grazing but huge flock of sheep and said, well, sure, have at it. So the driver parked his car. He got out and he plugged in his cell phone and plugged it into a laptop and started surfing over to a GPS satellite navigation system on the internet. And then he initiated a remote body heat scan of the area and the computer started computing and graphing and mapping out the heat scan and how many bodies were in that area. He sent some email, and after a few moments, he nodded at the responses, and finally he printed out a report on the little laser printer that he had in his glove compartment. He turned to the shepherd, waving the report, and he pronounced, you have exactly 1,586 sheep in your flock. The guy said, man, that's impressive. The shepherd said, I, I guess one of my sheep is yours. Pick out anyone you want. So the shepherd watched the young man select an animal, bundle it up into his car, and then the shepherd leaned in the window and said, Sir, if I can tell you exactly what your business is, will you give me back my sheep? Pleased to meet a fellow sportsman, the young man replied, You're on, old shepherd. The shepherd looked at him. He said, You're a consultant. The shepherd, without hesitation, said, Well, that's correct. I'm impressed. How did you know? How did you guess that? The shepherd said, It wasn't a guess. You drive into my field uninvited. You ask me to pay you for information that I already know. Then you answer questions that I haven't even asked you. On top of that, you don't know anything about my business. Now give me back my dog. <laughs> I hope you thought that was as funny as I did. If not, just mark it up to my bad sense of humor. But of course, now I want to talk about the real shepherd, the Lord God Almighty, our Creator, who put on the flesh 
the word that became flesh, John says in chapter 1, and dwelt among us who put on the flesh that we beheld as the person of Jesus Christ who identified himself as the good shepherd. We, the sheep, under his care, the sheep of his flock. So let's look at Psalm 23. I probably don't even have to put this up here for you, but I want you to be able to kind of see line by line where I'm going as I teach it tonight. So follow along with me as we go to Psalm 23. All right. You should be able to see this now. Psalm 23. I'm reading this from the King James because I grew up on the King James and I memorized this passage of Scripture on the King James. I normally don't preach from the King James. I have nothing against the King James. I just normally choose a, a modern scholar, scholarly translation of the Scriptures so that, um, and it is so that folks that are new to the Word and in this 21st century, they might not be left behind in some of the old King James English. But wow, when you get to the, <clears throat> excuse me, when you get to the 23rd Psalm, it can't be much more beautiful and poetic than this. So let's just, let me just, let's just follow along. Let me just read it. Most of you have it memorized, but let me just read it first without commenting. Then I want to come back and go through it almost line by line. So the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why don't you say it with me, folks? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to get back to that and kind of go line by line, but I just wanted to say to you that um, that is one of the most powerful and peaceful and ministering passages of Scripture to me that I know of. There are several that I use in my devotional life, and especially in times of just anxiousness or Listen, I'm telling you, there are times when maybe I've had a long, crazy, busy day and my head is jumbled and I lay down and I lift up my thoughts and my prayers. I lift up my prayers, my heart to the Lord. And, and sometimes I'll wake up maybe after an hour or two, you know, a little bit of insomnia. In this crazy world, almost everybody suffers with that from time to time. And, and what I have trained myself to do over the years is to just in my soul, just keep my eyes closed and to begin reciting the 23rd Psalm. Sometimes I'll recite the Lord's Prayer, things that I've learned from childhood, other passages of Scripture that, that I'll recite just in my soul. Next thing you know, I wake up and it's morning, somewhere in the midst of just speaking the Word of God. All of that floods my soul, eases my soul, and puts me right on into a peaceful sleep so that I'm ready to go for the next day. The 23rd Psalm is amazing. Every time I share what I'm going to share tonight, every time I recite it, every time I pray it over folks, it seems like there's healing that comes, emotional healing, spiritual healing. Sometimes people are saved just by reading this passage of Scripture. This is amazing. It is certainly, certainly anointed. Let's get back to it, and let me kind of go through it line by line. Look at this again. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I tell folks that, look, there's another way we can read this, and it's exact, it means the exact same thing. I'm not changing the Word of God. I'm just putting into it the context of its meaning. So I tell people sometimes to make this more personal, if we would begin by saying, because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, or I will not be in need, because the Lord is my shepherd. See, put the emphasis different. Instead of saying, because the Lord is my shepherd, just say, because the Lord is my shepherd. In other words, that is the Lord God, because Jesus Christ is my shepherd. I shall not want. Now, you know, the world is not my shepherd. My shepherd, my overseer, my my protector, the strong one in whom I run to, uh, to whom I run. 
because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or because the Lord is my shepherd. You see, wherever you put the emphasis, it has special and personal meaning. And then put that word because in front of that very first line. Because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And that word want doesn't mean that everything I desire, God's going to give me like I'm some spoiled child. But it just means the peace of my heart, the sustenance of my soul, the sustenance of my life. When Jesus Christ is unequivocally our shepherd, the overseer of our soul, when Jesus Christ is our Lord, then we do not have to be anxious. We do not have to be worrisome. Listen, there are things that startle me in my life. I, I, I mean, I'm just going to be honest with you. There are times when I'm startled and sometimes when I'm even anxious about things. And then I have to catch myself and immerse myself again in prayer and in Scripture. And sometimes I'll come right to Psalm 23 because it's so powerful. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I, I shall not ultimately be anxiety ridden. Why? Because God's got this. Because the Lord is God. God is the Lord. He is the shepherd who put on flesh and we saw him in the person of Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. And when we get that settled in our soul, even in times of anxiousness, then there's a peace that floods us. You know, King David wrote this. Now, scholars don't know exactly when it was written, but every one of the Bibles that you read, it'll say, a Psalm of David. Some believe that he was already king when he wrote this, looking back on when he was a shepherd boy, understanding the metaphor of his whole life that was pointing to God himself and to Jesus Christ who was to come, who David had a glimpse of, Psalm 22. You can read that prophecy. We'll study that together one night. But but I, I, I tend to agree with that. This, this, this psalm is so mature in its theology, yet so simple and beautiful and pristine. And it is metaphorical. David was a shepherd. He looked over his sheep. But now he is one of the sheep under the great shepherd. And now he gets it because he used to be a shepherd. So let's jump back into this and let's continue our study. So because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Watch this. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Well, in other words, again, when the Lord is our shepherd, when our life is wrapped up in the word of God, in the things of God, when our trust is in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is the one that brings restoration to our souls. He is the one that leads us beside still waters and calms us. He is the one from time to time who enables us, offers us, sometimes makes us <laughs> to lie down in green pastures. You know, I think of this, that's kind of what this that's kind of what the Lord's day is. That's what the Sabbath is or the and or the Lord's day. It is it's a time of rest, it's a time of healing for our physical bodies, for every cell and fiber and fabric of our bodies, but there's also something healing about worshiping together, about meeting together in worship when we can. Boy, we have discovered that, haven't we? So many churches around the world have been un unable to meet for months and, you know, watching things online, and I'm glad you're with us tonight, but it's not the same as being there in person and touching and laying hands on people and praying with people, speaking face to face and experiencing the the spirit of one another and the presence of the Holy Spirit among us. There's nothing that, that compares to that, and especially the healing power of it, and especially the calming effect of it. And so when the Lord is our shepherd and we desire to be in his house, we desire to be in his word, we desire to communicate with him in prayer, when we lift up our soul to him, even in times of anxiousness, then he leads us into those green pastures and he leads us beside the still waters. He makes us to lie down in the green pastures and he is the one that uh, keeps us from anxiousness, destroying ourselves. Let's continue. 
He restoreth my soul. But look at this. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Righteousness does not necessarily mean perfection. Although we strive as Christians, we strive to be as perfect as possible with the Holy Spirit's help. But we live in a fallen world filled with filth all around us. We have a fallen sin nature covered by the blood of Jesus, covered and filled with the Holy Spirit of God. But that doesn't mean that we don't still struggle with sin. And it doesn't mean we don't still struggle with impure thoughts or things coming out of our mouth that shouldn't or things that we're thinking or things that we put in our eyes or our ears that we shouldn't. And, but you see, when we stay connected to the shepherd, the word of God tells us if we will stay in his word, if we will stay connected to him, when he is truly shepherding our lives, he will lead us into the proper paths. He will lead us into the paths of righteousness. You can substitute there of right doing, of doing right. He will lead us into those paths. And in the midst of it, he is doing it for his name's sake. Now listen to this. Of course he's doing it for you and for me. Of course he's doing it for the sheep, for us, his children, because he loves us. But in the doing of that, he is also protecting and guarding his namesake, his holiness, his kingdom that is to come before the accusing eyes of the evil realm that Satan is over right now, including this earthly, earthly realm and the realm and the domain and the dominion of darkness. Now, all of that's going to end. Revelation 12, 12 tells us that Satan has been thrown down. He is filled with rage because he already knows. He knows right now that his time is short and getting shorter. He understands that. But in the midst of it, we, the sheep of the flock of Jesus Christ, born-again believers, when he is our shepherd, and when that's how we desire to live, and that's the desire of our heart as we lift it up before the Lord, then he directs our paths. He opens and closes doors, and he leads us into paths of right choices and right doing, righteousness. The ultimate goal, the ultimate covering is for his name's sake, for the blessing that he gives with his name attached to it, and we as his children. Well, let's go back to the scriptures as we continue. He leads us into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Look at the rest of this. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. I'm going to come back to that. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yeah. Even though I walk in the valley of the shadow, but the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff. Listen, not only does that apply perhaps to our very dying moments, and sometimes we minister that passage of Scripture that way, but you know what else it applies to? It applies to every single day of life and every single moment of life because we are living in the valley of the shadow of death. See, death if you're a born-again believer, it, it is a real shadow, and it can be a scary shadow, but it's just a shadow because on the other side, that dimensional divide, there is life. Jesus told the thief on the cross today, you will be with me in paradise. You'll be alive, whole, clean. All through the scriptures, there's pictures of that and promises of that truth. But in the meantime, we're living in a fallen world. Man, we can see that now probably better than ever any time in our lifetime. We can see how fallen and depraved and fake and false and horrific it is. Completely, people are deluded. They're delusional. This world is fallen. But as we walk through this valley of the shadow of death, we, born-again believers, under the blood of Jesus, with the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us, we don't have to fear because the Lord God, our Creator, He is our shepherd. He is our rock. He is the one in whom we trust. He is our strength. He is our high tower. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. The word yea means yes, yes. Even though I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear evil. Folks, and I have lived decades of my life that way. 
people ask me all the time, you know, aren't you afraid to get on an airplane, do all this traveling, and what if the plane crashes? What if you get killed? What if you're doing missions work? What if somebody gets hurt? What if this? What if that? What if this? What if you get COVID-19? What if you get the flu? What if you die? What if... And here's my answer. I'm not being naive. I take all the common sense precautions I can take in my own life and in the lives of others especially people I'm responsible for as a shepherd and a pastor. But the bottom line is we're all going to die of something unless we're caught up in the rapture before then. But in the meantime, this is called life. And death is a part of life, as weird as that sounds. And, and if you're a born-again believer, you're in the hands of God. We're in the valley of the shadow of death. That's what David, David understood this now. As a former shepherd, now he's a king, he gets it. And he says, so with, because the Lord is my shepherd, Yes, even though I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to fear evil. I don't have to fear death anymore. Oh, do I want to die today? Not necessarily. Am I walking around anxiety-ridden about the fact I'm going to die one day? I could die today. I could get a virus and die. No, not as a born-again believer. Now, if you need to stay home and take precautions and separate yourself from people, maybe you're particularly susceptible with, susceptible with medical conditions, maybe you're already sick, I get that. that. That's not a lack of faith. That's just using your common sense. But your overall attitude is, Lord, my life is in your hands. If you take me today, you take me. If you take me tomorrow, take me then. If it's years from now, that's fine. But right now, I'm walking in the valley of the shadow of death. See, doesn't this make sense? And therefore, I, I will fear no evil, but because the Lord is my shepherd. And then I love this part. And you, you, you prepare a table before me. Watch this. In the presence of my enemies. That almost sounds out of place. Why, why are we talking about enemies in such a beautiful, peaceful psalm? Brings tranquility to our soul. And the next thing you know, we're talking about in the presence of my enemies, you're preparing a table. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. What does that mean? It means, <laughs> who are our enemies? Well, you know, biblically speaking, those that hate us, we, we, we do our best not to go out hating and taking vengeance and wrath out on other people. God says, let me handle that. You just serve me. You keep your eyes on me. I try to do that as a pastor. For three decades, I've lived that and modeled that to my church family and our community. I don't take vengeance on anybody. I just, people attack me. They attack the church. They trash me and my family. I bring them before the Lord. Now, if there's some complete horrendous lie, I'll defend myself that way. But I don't take vengeance. Now, some of these people have declared themselves enemies of mine. I, I don't, they're not enemies of mine. If they need me to minister to them, they call me, I'll be there. If they're on their deathbed and they start feeling guilty about some of the things they've said or done and they want me there because they want to ask forgiveness or they just want to reconcile, I'll be there. I just turn that over to the Lord because, see, in the midst of these years, God has prepared a table for me. He has blessed me. He has blessed me. He has expanded the reach of my ministry. He has given me all kinds of blessings in my family, my precious marriage to my wife and my children and grandchildren and the church family. And so many of them are like children and grandchildren to me after 30 years. And all of those blessings, he prepares a table before me in the presence of those who have declared themselves my enemies. A lot of them have to watch me on TV now or, or listen to me on the radio or at least hear about it or see the books I've written and hear people talk about how it's changed their life for Jesus. I mean, I'm not saying that to brag or to gloat. I'm just saying I've watched God do this. I've, I'm, I've, li I've been living in the midst of Psalm 23 for decades, not fearing the valley of the shadow of death, just keeping my eyes on Jesus, understanding that in the midst of it all, every stand I've ever taken in the Word of God that the community around me hated me for, it doesn't matter. Because in the midst of those that now think they're my enemies, God has prepared a table before me. He's anointed my head with oil. That's in the, in the ancient days, that was a perfume. In other words, he makes me smell good. <laughs> he, he keeps me cleansed and fills my cup and it overflows. It's amazing to think about. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. In other words, when all of this is over and the valley of the shadow of death truly closes in on us in this, in this fallen world and in these fallen bodies that we have, then we pass from this dimension to the next like the thief on the cross, instantaneously opening our eyes in paradise. That's absolutely astounding. 
and then we get to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever? Oh, wow. See, but while we're here in this fallen world, in this valley of the shadow of, of death, think about how important it is for this earthly house of the Lord to be in our lives, either through live stream because we can't physically be there or because some of you are on other sides of oceans or other sides of our nation. But think of how important it is to be in the house of the Lord, earthly speaking. Think of how amazingly unbelievable it will be to be in the house of the Lord forever and forever and forever in a glorified body in paradise and then ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ on the face of this earth. Those are promises in the word of God. Listen, God's kept every other promise about Jesus Christ. He brought him. He went to a cross. He rose from the grave. He ascended into heaven. Three years of public ministry before the world. He didn't hide in a corner. All the miracles he did, all the prophecies prophecies he fulfilled from the Old Testament, every inch of his life fulfilling prophecies. And yet that same word with prophecies that are just yet to come declare to us, we will rule and reign with him. He is coming again. He will have a kingdom on this, on this earth that he created. He will have it. Satan will fail. Satan is doomed. This valley of the shadow of death will disappear and there will be nothing but life and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, this is why it's worth it to serve the Lord with all of your life, all of your heart, all of your understanding, the Bible says. All of your praise, this is why. Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I want to end. So I started with a funny story. Now I want to end with one that's much more beautiful. Some of you have heard this. It's all over the internet now. I can remember years ago before there was an internet, I read it in a book and I told it to my congregations, people I've preached to down through the years and they just love it. Now on the internet, I find that there are all kinds of variations of it. Some of the variations tell the story as though it's an actual event and even names names of people that were there. I, I don't know if it's true or not, but the story, even if it's not true, it's a, it's a parable. And it's a metaphor with a punchline that's beautiful. So let me tell it again. And for some of you, this will be the first time you've ever heard it. But the story is told of a great orator who was invited to speak at a huge auditorium in a, in a public event in a large city. He was an orator of the classics, and he would recite poetry and Shakespeare, and people just loved it. And this is back in the days before television and movies and all of that. And so people were entertained by this, and they loved it, and it was a, a time of inspiration. And so people packed out the auditorium. This great orator took the stage and began to speak and quoted Shakespeare and quoted the classics and did it with such drama and flair, and people were just moved by it. At the end of it, to a standing ovation, he took his bows, he looked at the audience, he said, now, as a closing final treat, I would like somebody to just, well, several people, to just raise your hand and give me something that you want me to, to, uh, to speak, and I, and, and I will do that. Kind of like an ask the preacher time. So instantly a hand went up about midways through this huge auditorium, and it was a hand of an elderly man sitting by himself. And the orator saw him and had a little compassion in his heart and pointed to him and said, yes, you, sir, you, you. And he said, would you recite the 23rd Psalm? It's my favorite. And the orator said, yes, sir, I would be honored to do that. He said, I know it by heart. And he said, um, let me do it for you. And so the audience grew still and hushed, and he began with all of his dramatic flair. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still water. He went right on through. The people just went crazy. They loved it. Pl applauded, standing ovation. Now, one little part of the story I left out, but I can fit it in right here, is the orator had told the man, I will do it on one condition, and that is at the end of what I do, <clears throat> if you would come recite it as you had learned it. And the old man had agreed. So the orator finished. People gave him a standing ovation. The old man dutifully started making his way down the aisle, had a little cane, 
people watched him and they were kind of feeling sorry for him, thinking, oh my gosh, he's, he's going to feel like an idiot next to this guy. <laughs> but the, the orator helped the man up onto the stage, got him up behind the podium. He took his cane, hung it on the edge of the podium, and he began. Tears were already streaming down his cheek. The Lord is my shepherd. And because of this, I shall never want. And he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. And he leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And then he stopped. He said, oh, Lord, forgive me. And his lip quivered and tears streamed down his cheek. Yea, even though I'm in the valley of the shadow of the, the valley of the shadow of death, you are there with me. And he raised his hands in worship and prayer and praise, and he began to weep before he could continue. He finally made it through and he finished. There was no standing ovation. The people couldn't move. They were mesmerized. They were they were blown away. People were weeping. Grown men were weeping, hiding their faces in shame. Others were in prayer. Some got on their knees and were actually giving their life to the Lord. The orator was in awe. At the end of it all, he helped the little old man down off the stage. He went back to the podium and he said this. The orator said, Folks, you've heard two very different versions of the 23rd Psalm tonight. Two very different reactions from you, the audience. He said, I can tell you what the difference is. He said, you see, I know the 23rd Psalm. I learned it as a child. I'm a great orator. I'm a drama artist. I know the 23rd Psalm. I know how to quote and to recite the 23rd Psalm to bring an emotional response to you. I know the 23rd Psalm. And then he paused and he said, but that man, he knows the shepherd. I just know the Psalm. He knows the shepherd personally. His recitation has the power. Mine had the fleeting emotion because he knows the shepherd. The power of God's word has come over all of you here tonight. I pray that God has done something like that with me. I'm not making myself to be like that old man. I'm just saying, I know the shepherd. I know his word. I live this. I live it, and I've been living it for decades, and I continue to live it. Many of you have as well. Some of you were living it before I was even born. So I'm saying to you tonight as we close, I pray that you know the shepherd. If you do, stand in that word. Anytime you feel anxious, anytime you feel heartbroken, anytime you can't even get to sleep, begin reciting that in your soul and in your mind and in your heart. Maybe out loud if it's appropriate. Driving down the road, recite that psalm. Turn off the radio and speak that word. And watch what God does with it. Jesus Christ, he said of himself in John chapter 10, I am the shepherd. My sheep hear my voice, and they know me, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. Jesus said, you know, the good shepherd lays his life down for his sheep. And then he said, I am the gate. You can only come into the flock, into the field through me the Good Shepherd. Oh, I pray you know him. Thank you for letting me spend this time with you tonight. It has been my joy and my honor to do so. May the Lord bless you and keep you always, now and forevermore. I hope to see you soon in church or back here on one of these live streams, but I also hope to see you soon in glory somewhere around the throne. This has been a word for you from the Word of God from Pastor Carl Gallops, live on this Wednesday evening. God bless you.